you can take your Bibles and open them to the book of Colossians, chapter 3. One thing that I trust has become apparent to you during this conference on Colossians is that Christianity is Christ. It is Christ, it is Christ, it is Christ. It is not some cheap substitute that a number of false teachers, even since Paul's day, have been trying to pawn off. It's been going on since the inception of the church over almost 2,000 years ago. In fact, Pastor Roxer, several years ago, penned this definition of the Christian life. The authentic Christian life is designed to be a daily personal vertical fellowship with God based on your identification with Jesus Christ, motivated primarily by His love and provided totally by His grace and power, which is enjoyed through repeated responses of faith as believer diligently seeks the Lord, resulting in spiritual growth in Christ-likeness, faithful, faithful obedience to God's will, and fruitful service to others in love, all, by the, all to the glory of God. Now, this is not inspired. Uh, however, it does an outstanding job, in my opinion, of capturing the essence of Christianity is. And conspicuous by its absence, we don't have a list here of do's and don'ts. We don't have handle not, touch not, taste not, have this experience, because none of those things are the essence of Christianity. See, the theme of Colossians is the supremacy and sufficiency of Jesus Christ. And what Colossians chapter 2 made very clear is Christianity is not about what you do. It's not observing this, eating, not eating Big Macs, not celebrating Christmas, and all the hundred other things Pastor Roxer said last night. Um, it's first and foremost how you think. It takes place in your mind. Now, it finds expression in your words and in your actions, but that's not where it begins, because Christianity is a relationship with the very God of the universe through the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, prior to salvation, you had no relationship with God, and you may have been trying to acquire a relationship with God through the cheap substitutes that are out there. In fact, this is salvation by works. Salvation by works says you need more than the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was obviously necessary, what he did was not enough, and you must do your part. You must do whatever percentage you deem necessary. And this could, your contribution to this could be any combination of your own effort. It might consist of being good, going to church, giving some money, getting baptized or confirmed, praying, making promises, asking Jesus in your heart. The list is endless. And yet, if you could get to heaven through your efforts and obtain life and obtain righteousness through your efforts, well, then Christ obviously wasted his time. He's not really sufficient. He's not really supreme. And yet, how many people have bought into this? trying to do what only Christ can do. And so when it comes to salvation, it's by grace. It's a recognition that Jesus Christ provided all that is necessary for us to receive the free gift of everlasting life. And it's through His work. There on the cross of Calvary, He paid 100% of what you owe God in terms of paying for your sins. God, who is just, demands a penalty must be paid. If you are interested in paying off that penalty, what you will find out is your good works won't do it, in fact, it'll cost you all eternity in hell to satisfy the justice that God demands. But because Christ loved you, he went to the cross of Calvary, and there he died in your place, and all of your sins, all of the filth of your mind and mine, and all the horrible things that we have and ever will do, he took upon himself. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. And there on the cross of Calvary, he cried out, it is finished, which means your sins and my sins, the penalty that we justly deserve, the wrath that we deserve to take, was paid in full by the Savior. And because he did that, and because he rose from the grave and God's justice was satisfied, salvation is now freely offered to you, but it must be accepted on his terms, which is placing 100% of your trust in him alone, apart from any work on your part. And when you as an individual come to recognize that your good works cannot save you, that the cheap substitutes that you've been buying into are in fact just that, and you place 100% of your trust in Christ, Salvation is received. Eternal life is now yours. You now have a living hope. In fact, Christ is in you, the hope of glory. You become a new creation in Christ. 
In fact, you were born again into a life in Him. He is now your life. In fact, all that He is and all that He has becomes yours because you have a position in Him. That's mind-boggling. Every spiritual blessing in heavenly places has been put at your disposal in the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, the reception of these exceeding great and precious facts and promises are yours because Christ is your life. He's your life. This is your reality. You're a new creation in Christ. The old you has passed away. Verse, what is it, 11 of chapter 2 says that you were circumcised with the circumcision of Christ, which means you were cut off from the dominion of that sin nature, which kicked you all over the universe prior to your salvation. You are to count yourself as died to the sin on the cross, and as you do, the effect of the cross, which is applied by the Spirit of God to you, and your old person in Adam is now realized. And because that's the new you and the new reality, as Pastor Pete so eloquently stated, we are to now seek those things which are above. We are to set our mind on things above where Christ is. We've died. Our life is now hid with Christ and God. And so the question becomes, since we are in Christ and Christ is our life, well, what does that look like? We've got a world, a religious world out there that keeps, again, pawning off these cheap substitutes that says it's a matter of do's and don'ts, it's a matter of experience, it's a matter of touch not, taste not, observe this, observe that, and that's not it at all. What we're going to see here in verses 12 through 17 is the essence of Christ manifesting His life through you. Pete, again, explained what Christianity is not, beginning in verse 5 through 11. The word put off there in verse 5 means to reckon as true those members which were part of the old you, the things that have no business, they're not part of who you are in Christ. These are not what Christ's life looks like. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Verse 8 says, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication or language out of your mouth, lying to one another. These things are not part of who you are in Christ. They have nothing to do. They have no business rearing their ugly head in your life because that's not who you are in Christ. See, because you're in Christ, He is now the source of your Christian life. You were born into Him. God has made you spiritually complete in Him. All you will ever need for your Christian life, now and forever, has been given to you freely in Christ. And He is ready all those resources are there ready, waiting in the Lord Jesus, complete and accessible to you by faith. This, again, is your position in Christ. And your condition in time as you walk in Christ is absolutely dependent upon your complete resource in Christ. Faith rests in the reality that you are complete in Christ and He is all you need. And so, since you're complete in Christ, it will not do to try to add to that finished work. That's painfully obvious when it comes to first tense salvation, but is just as true when it comes to second tense salvation or sanctification. Christ is your life. And as his dear child, your life in Christ is now a matter by walking by faith and appropriating from them ever abundant of resource of Christ as your life to live or allow him to live his life in you and through you. And that takes place as you gaze upon him in the Word of God. Again, Christ is your life, which means Christianity is not do's and don'ts. It's a matter of presenting yourself to Him and allowing the life of Christ which is in you to manifest itself in you and through you. And again, this occurs moment by moment as you abide in Christ and allow His Word to abide in you. As has been seen several times in this conference, Paul captures it very well in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I, the old man who lives, but now Christ lives in me, the new man. In the life which I now live in this flesh, I live how? By faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Christianity is Christ. And so Paul now describes for us what does that look like? Beginning here in verse 12. You can follow along as I read. It says, Therefore is the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, 
so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you are also recalled in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father through Him. See, Christ, who is your life, is manifested in you and through you by, first of all, acknowledging your position in Him. Acknowledging your position in Him. Verse 12 begins with the word, therefore, and as we've seen, you need to ask, what is the therefore, therefore? And in the median context here, it refers to the fact that you have put off the old man and his deeds, and you've put on the new man in Christ. You know, I live in Grand Rapids, and I thought about this recently. Most of the people that attend Itasca Bible Church don't live in town. In fact, I don't know if anyone lives in town. And we all live out in the country, and all of us have septic systems. And if you have a septic system, the last thing you want to do is have it back up or get plugged up or whatever it might be. And imagine if you had a septic system that was clogged up, and you had to go out there, and you had to dig up the sewer line, and you had to uh, dig down into that tank and all the rest of it, and, and you had to fix the problem. And let's face it, it smells, it's ugly, it's gross, you can't wait to be done with it. And if it's all said and done, what do you do with those clothes? Do you walk into the house and sit on the couch, have a cup of coffee? (laughs) Not if mama's around, that's for sure. (laughs) No, you take them off. You throw them away. You get rid of them. You hustle to the shower. You get cleaned up. And so after you go in the shower and you get all cleaned up, are you going to go back and put those old clothes on that you just used to clean out the septic system? No way. And yet, as Christians, what often happens? They put their septic clothes back on, and they smell bad. And you know, that's really what Paul is saying here. He says, you know, when you got saved, you took those septic clothes and you put them off. They smell, they make you smell. You've been cleaned up by Christ, you've been given a new set of clothes. Those things that were mentioned in verses 5 through 11 have been put off. You'd be nuts to put those clothes back on. In fact, anyone, as Pete said, who's thinking reasonably and logically would never even think about doing it. And that's what we're told here as well. Christ is now your life. It's no longer you who live. Christ now lives in you. And your new creation in Christ, you've been given a new set of clothes. In fact, it might be helpful to look at it as not an outward set of clothes, but perhaps an inward set of clothes that find expression on the outside. See, the clothing you wore prior to salvation was one of characterized by fulfilling the lusts of the flesh and of the mind. And yet we're told here, do not lie to one another since you've put off the old man. Notice you've been clothed with the righteousness of Christ. You couldn't wait to get rid of that stinky garment. You've put on the new man who's renewed in the knowledge according to the image who created him. Again, prior to salvation, you were dead in trespasses and sins. This is your position. You were dead to God. You had no relationship with Him. You were considered a son of disobedience. You were obstinate, as Peter explained. You were by nature worthy of God's wrath. And because that was true of you, how did you function? Well, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air. This has characterized you as an unbeliever. The things that he emphasized in the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life were the very things that thrilled your soul in one form or another. And so you conducted yourself in the lust of your flesh, seeking to fulfill the desires of your flesh and of your mind. That's how you action, because that's who you were. And guess what? You're not that person anymore. You spent your time as an unbeliever trying to fulfill your life with some cheap substitute that just didn't get it done. It was all about you, one way or another. And if things weren't going the way you thought they should, you fought and kicked and screamed and lied and had pants on fire and all the rest we saw last week, trying to get it, or last hour. See, you've risen with Christ, your new creation in Christ. You've been separated positionally from those very things that kept you in bondage as an unbeliever. Those desires 
You no longer have to obey. You died to this when you got saved, when retroactively you were crucified with Christ, you became separated positionally from these desires. You've risen with Christ, you now have the mind of Christ, you have resurrection power living within you. And if this wasn't true, then we have no basis for an appeal here beginning in verse 12. What would Paul be appealing to? A bunch of septic clothes. It's not going to get it done, but you're a new creation in Christ. And so these are the things that are to be manifested in you and through you by God's grace because Christ is living in you. And so when you acknowledge your position in Christ, what you're doing is you recognize you've put on the new man. And what we recognize about this new man is it's created in the image of Jesus Christ. Christianity is Christ living his life in you and through you. It's not you trying to live like a Christian. It's Christ living his life in you and through you. And so when you think of your position in Christ, how are you described here? Verse 12 says, Therefore is the elect of God holy and beloved. You're called three things here. You're referred to as the elect of God, literally the chosen of God. God has chosen you as his child to salvation and glorification. He has chosen you to be holy and without blame before him in love. That is your position in him all by the grace of God. He calls you holy here. The word holy means to be set apart unto God for his purposes. Throughout the scriptures, this word is used of inanimate objects as well as people. When something is holy, something is set apart for God and his purposes. What makes it holy is not some mystical thing about it. You know, I was reminded of that. that occasionally, I go to the Y. I should probably go a little more, but I, I, uh, I go early in the morning, and there's a whole group of retired guys uh, that go there, and I've gotten to know a lot of them, and they make me feel good about myself because they can't do much, but, <laughs> uh, but there's, I've, I've witnessed to several of them, a lot of them pastor, some are saved, we have good conversations, and one guy I've witnessed to a few times heard a joke, and he says, I got a great joke for you, and he's... I don't know how old he's. He's old, though. Um, but he, uh, he says, you know how they make holy water? I go, yeah, they boil the hell out of it. <laughs> he just heard it that morning, and he thought it was great, and I thought he never heard it. I said, that joke's older than you are. <laughs> but you know what? I remember it brought back to mind when I was an altar boy in, uh, in the Catholic Church that the priest would go fill up the holy water out of this one spigot, and I always wondered, hmm, where does that spigot come from? And I avoided it because I thought if I did something wrong and I tried to drink out of it, I'd go up in flames or something. That's what, that's what mysticism does. It scares the out of you, you know? So he thought he was really funny, but I ruined it for him. But we are holy. We are holy. We're set apart to God for his purposes because we have a position in Christ. And again, this is why 1 Corinthians 6 tells us we're to flee sexual morality it has nothing to do with Christ. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual morality sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body now is the temple of the Holy Spirit that makes you holy, who is in you, whom you have from God, and notice you're not your own. You've been set apart in Christ for God. And since you were bought with a price, you are to now glorify God in your body and your spirit, which belongs to God. You're holy. Amazing. And you can now live in light of that position. And the third description here is beloved. This is the Greek word for God's love. It's the love shown at Calvary, a love that denies self for the benefit of the object love. In fact, this word beloved here is a participle in the perfect tense, which means if you're saved here this morning, you have been loved by God, and you're permanently loved by God. You're the permanent object of His love in the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, the perfect tense is used to show the far-reaching and abiding character of that love. God cannot love you any more than He already does in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so these terms describe God's perspective toward each and every one of His children. This is true of you. It's true of me if you're saved. It has nothing to do with how you're doing spiritually this moment. It's not based on how you are responding to Him. You're not worthy of any of these things. It's his perspective toward you because you're in Christ. And where are you to set your mind? On things above. The fact that you're elect, that you're holy, 
that you're beloved. And because that's true, Christ who is your life is to manifest, be manifested in you and through you by manifesting new mental attitudes, beginning here in verse 12. Because of your position in Christ, you are to reckon yourself to be dead to those selfish desires of the sin nature that characterize the old man. And we are now to put on specific virtues here that reflect the character of Christ. What are they here in verse 12? Tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. You know, we know again... uh, In our physical word, clothes do not make the man, but oftentimes the character of the man is reflected in his clothes. And Paul is saying here that the new man, the new person that you are in Christ, is reflected in new spiritual attire after the image of him that created it. In other words, these are the things that characterize Christ, so these are the things that are to characterize you and me. This is a command. It's in the aorist tense. In other words, make a decision, make this your settled attitude as a believer. This is what God desires to produce in your life. It's in the middle of voice, which means we are to be intentionally involved in seeing these virtues manifested in our life, and they will benefit us personally. And you know, these, these, this list of virtues here is, is, they're not just some arbitrary list of things. Again, these are the things that are Christ, Christ in you. And so what are we talking about here? As we think of the list here, the first thing mentioned is tender mercies. Tender mercies. If you've got a King James Version, it says bowels of mercies. As bowels was a term uh, in Jewish culture that spoke of internal organs. And so he's talking about here about having heartfelt compassion. The virtue here, the virtue of Christ is heartfelt, heartfelt compassion. And so God says, I'm living my life through you, and that's going to reflect itself in mercy and compassion, a tender sensitivity to others, having a sense of empathy and sympathy toward others. You know, it's helpful sometimes to see how this term is used with reference to God. In Luke 6, 36, we read, Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. This is a reflection of an attitude of God. Notice how it's used of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him, and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus, notice, moved with compassion. Someone society is thrown to to the curb like a bag of trash Christ had compassion on. And he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing. Be cleansed. In fact, Bruce Scott brought this out. I thought it was an excellent illustration of compassion. Because here we have a picture of that scene, perhaps. But notice what, in Mark 6.31, Christ, in the height of his ministry, is pestered nonstop from sunup to sundown. He tells his disciples here, come aside by yourselves and desert a place and rest for a while, for there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. And so they departed to a deserted place in a boat by themselves. But the multitude saw them departing, and many knew him and ran there on foot from all the cities. We know where he's going. And they arrived before them, and they came together to him. And when Jesus, when he came out, said, I've had enough of you people. You know, I've had a long day. I've been doing this all day long. Go somewhere else. No. He was moved with compassion for them. Because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. He began to teach them many things. I mean, think about that. When you've been busy, when you've had a rough day, when you got blah, 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 what do you say? Hey, I'm entitled to my own space here, right? Says who? <laughs> Is that what Christ says? I'm entitled to my space here. Thank you very much. You can go. No. See, we think we're compassionate, don't we? Not even close. In fact, James is very clear that in James 1, 25 through 27, I can't think of exactly what it says, but you are to show true religion before God is showing mercy and compassion to those that are the, again, kicked to the curb of society, the ones who cannot reciprocate in any way, shape, or form, the widows and the orphans. And so the character of Christ means 
I've got a mental attitude of mercy that the Holy Spirit produces in me and through me as I ponder how Christ treats me in love. Amazing, isn't it? We could spend all day on each one of these, but obviously we can't. And so we're going to go to kindness. Kindness is mentioned as a fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22. It's the friendly and helpful spirit that seeks to meet the needs of others through kind deeds. Someone has simply defined it, it's mercy and grace in action. And the Holy Spirit here wants to work in you to give you a heart of compassion so that you see a need and you desire to be used to meet that need and, show you, and, and therefore you show kindness. And this is what, again, this Christ-like attitude is manifested in Luke 6.35, when Christ said, Love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. Who does that? And notice your reward will be great, not on earth, but in heaven, for you will be the sons of the Most High. For notice, He, God, is kind to who? The unthankful and the evil. God is kind to the unthankful and the evil. Now, does that describe you? Are you kind to the one that badmouths you, that abuses you, that rips you, that takes advantage of you, that gossips about you? You know, this is, you know what this means is that God is kind to you and me because guess what? We're unthankful and evil. And God, again, wants to produce via the Holy Spirit the same attitude that He has toward you to be kind to the thankful and the evil in your life. I guess we're getting humbled here, aren't we? In fact, that's... Notice, Titus 3, 4, and 5, when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us not because of righteous things we had done, because of His mercy. That's what the Spirit of God wants to duplicate in your mind and mine because we're new creations in Christ. It's Him living His life in us and through us. It leads to humility, true humility, not this false nonsense that the Gnostics were trying to convince the Colossians was a show of humility. This is true humility. They were trying to impress you with how humble they were. That's not humility. See, humility is a true understanding and mindset of oneself. It's the opposite of pride because you have nothing to boast in. Humility is an accurate and biblical assessment of oneself that recognizes God's evaluation of you. And God says, in your flesh dwells no good thing. And so what is there for you to boast in? It recognizes that if anything gets done, it's by the grace of God. Paul recognized this. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than all. But it wasn't really me. It was the grace of God that was with me. You know, Paul didn't think he was a hotshot. And even though he recognized this principle, God still had to give him a thorn, we're told in 2 Corinthians 12, to keep him humble. Because God was in, emphatically concerned that what was come through Paul was, again, the life of Christ. See, Paul didn't operate on the merit principle. He was a usable vessel in the hand of Almighty God. And it recognizes that if I haven't sinned, it's only by the grace of God, not because I'm such a hot shot. You've got nothing to be proud about. You know, when something is done, do you take credit or do you give God the glory? You know what I've seen as the pastor of a church is sometimes others will minister and someone, because they're bugged by that person, will never say thanks. They won't humble themselves to say thanks to someone for ministering because they think they're above that person. It's enough to make a billy goat puke. I mean, come on. Well, that, if I thank them, that'll, make, that'll reflect negatively on me somehow. Good night. 1 Corinthians 4, 7. Who makes you to differ from another? What do you got going for yourself that makes you special? What do you have that you not receive? The answer is nothing. Now, so if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast if you have not received it? I mean, who do you think you are? Guess what? You're nothing unless God gave you something. And so why do you think you're something? You need to read Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel chapter 4, before you have to eat grass like an ox and figure it out, right? 
We're told in Romans 12, 3, Paul says, I say to you through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to everyone the measure of faith. You know, some believers think that they're above certain things, that, you know, cleaning a toilet bowl, for example, is someone else's business. Well, why do you think you're above that? I mean, the Lord Jesus Christ, in John 13, donned a towel and did the humblest of tasks, washing the disciples' feet. This was a task reserved for the lowest-ranking slave in the household. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if we had foot washing here? Who here would be volunteer to wash my feet? I mean, do you know where my feet have been? Remember, growing up, we'd go to some guy's house. He could, you'd have to just take a breath and go in and say, is he home? Okay. I mean, his feet were so bad. And I'm sure, well, we, we can just, you know, you get the point, right? <laughs> we're to be clothed with humility, Peter tells us. You know, humility is reflecting the fact that you're going to be honest with yourself. You don't seek to cover your tracks, but you humbly admit when you're wrong. You know, there's too many believers that would rather die than admit they're wrong. Are you the kind of believer that always has to be right and would never admit they're wrong? Well, if that's your attitude, Christ isn't using you, and he can't use you, and you're wallowing in your own mire. You miss it. You know, humility means that I'm willing to allow the Word of God to accomplish what God wants in my life because it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, notice for correction and instruction in righteousness. A humble spirit says, thanks, I needed the correction. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you for using even the spiritual leadership to come around and give me a little bump. And I'll can say, it says, I'll consider what you say. You know, what I have seen again as a pastor is that I run into believers from time to time that have, in the past were part of our church but are just like a poor sheep, you know, that's lost. And, and I'll run into them and say, hey, how are you doing, when I know that everything is unraveling in life and they tell me it's fine. And I've just seen time and time again believers who don't come out and hear the Word of God and they don't allow the, thinking, the teaching of the Word of God to challenge their thinking and allow it to recalibrate their thinking. They think they're doing fine spiritually and they're not because they're not hearing the Word of God so their thinking can't be recalibrated. Like someone told me last night at dinner that their relative doesn't come out and hear the word of God because they walk out thinking so lousy about themselves. Well, the truth isn't always pretty. And the whole point is so that you would adjust and realize it's not about you, it's about Christ. And so the believers that don't hear the word of God regularly have this false conception of themselves. They don't take correction. They always think you're the problem. That's not humility. What else? We got meekness. This word carries the idea of power, authority used appropriately. It does not mean weak. It means meekness. It's coupled with humility and sensitivity. Galatians 6.1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such one in a spirit of meekness as you consider yourself, lest you also be tempted. It, means, it may mean being firm, but at the same time being gentle. It includes humility. It's not demanding anything. You know, when you're demanding something, that should tell you right now, where do you see Christ demanding anything? Now, Christ requested things. There's a difference between requesting and demanding. And so when you're meek, you're not going to come from above with your nose in the air in a holier-than-thou attitude because you recognize the only reason you're not up to your neck in trouble is because of the grace of God. Absolute power under perfect control. It's a strong person laying down their rights, trusting God instead of demanding. What else do we have? We have long suffering. Long suffering. This word is often translated patience in the New Testament. There's another Greek word that speaks of bearing up under difficult circumstances, that's hupomone. This one is macrothromia. And this has to do with our reaction, not to circumstances, but to people that God allows or sends into our life. 
Because you are in Christ, you can be long-suffering with those with whom you otherwise could not be. What was before impossible is now impossible, is what it comes down to. And this is the patience that God has showed toward you and me. Do you recognize that you've been the object of God's patience and long-suffering? I love how Paul captured it. He says, I thank Jesus Christ our Lord who enabled me because he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. And this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. That's humility. However, for this reason I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. All long suffering. Have you stopped and thought about how patient God has been with you? The longer I'm saved, the more I appreciate God's amazing patience toward me. And the Spirit of God wants to reproduce that same mental attitude in you and me. And again, it's a fruit of the Spirit. New King James calls it long-suffering. NASB calls it patience. King James calls it long-suffering. NAV calls it forbearance. And this is needed because there are things about each other that drive us crazy, do they not? Undoubtedly, there's personalities in this room that bug you, and you bug others. And there's some here that may have mistreated you, and so forth. And yet, what are we called to do? With all lowliness and meekness with long suffering, we are to forbear one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We're to have the same this mindset in the body of Christ. This is what the Spirit of God through The life of Christ wants to be demonstrated in your life and mine. We're to make every effort to guard the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. This is the attitude of Christ. Is this how you think? Is this how you think? Is there someone here you say, there's no way I'm showing grace to that person? That's not coming from Christ. I mean, we all want to be showing grace, right? But are you willing to extend grace to the person who made a poor decision? You know, as we look at these five virtues, what jumps off the page is these are the fruit of the Spirit working your thinking through the Word of God. This is Christ in you. Only He can produce them. You know, I have found as soon as I start working on compassion, I lose my patience. It's like dieting. Every diet I've ever gone on, I've gained weight. Why? Because I'm thinking about food. And if I think about being compassionate, I get annoyed. This is why Christ has to do it. And these guys think, you know, I'm kind of a patient guy. You're not the standard. Uh, See, what we need to recognize here is the real test of these virtues is found in their application to one another. Their application to one another. Notice verses 13 and 14. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If any man has to complain against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also you must do. Notice the one another's here. You got one another, one another, another. That's the test. These are actually the two participles, bearing and forgiving, that express the means by which the action of the finite verb, clothe yourselves, is to be carried out. In other words, how do I know I put on these things? How do I know that Christ is manifesting himself in me and through me? Well, do you have a heart of compassion? Is there kindness, humility, and meekness and long-suffering going on? Are you forbearing one another? You know, forbearing has a positive and a negative aspect to it. Negatively, it means you need to endure or put up with one another. The positive means you need to support one another. So if I'm forbearing you, I'm not only putting up with you, I'm supporting you. I'm supporting you. It's not, listen, I put up with you once, man. I cannot stand it anymore, right? I mean, good night. No. It's amazing how people 
realize that they have to forbear, but they don't actually believe that someone has to forbear them. It's just shocking. It's no different than giving a survey. In 90-some percent of the surveys I do, everyone thinks they've got an 80 or 90 percent chance of going. They think there's something. And I tell them, guess what? You're at zero. No. Yes. <laughs> oh, forgiveness. How do I know that they put on these Christ-like mental attitudes? Are you forbearing others? Are you forgiving others? In fact, what is forgiveness? You know, to forgive someone is to release a person from the guilt of what they've done. It's not holding something against them. It's not... It, it's functioning on the basis of grace. It's never, I'll forgive you if. No, it's freely done, no strings attached. It's not, I'll forgive you when I feel like it or you made it up to me or because I like you. You know, forgiveness is not ignoring those who wrong us, hoping they go away. It's not refusing to hit back. It's not overlooking the sin. It's not putting this person on probation. How does God forgive? It removes the wrong from the record. It releases them from their guilt. Have you let it go? Or is the axe handle still out of the buried hatchet, sticking out of the ground? Christ forgets it. And he treats us in grace like the Father took back his son. That's forgiveness. This is how Christ forgave you. Isn't that what verse 13 tells us? I mean, Paul recognized that we could have a complaint against someone. He recognizes that reality, but that's not the way it's to stand. We're to forgive them. Now, again, that doesn't mean that things might not have to be worked out in some capacity. They may. But, you know, that is a separate issue from internal forgiveness. I mean, how many grudges are you allowed to hold against a fellow believer? But you don't know what they've done to me. Maybe I do. That doesn't matter. I also know what you've done to Christ. Are you bitter at someone here this morning for something they've done? They've snubbed you. They've gossiped about you. They deceived you about something. They were inconsiderate and totally selfish. How would God have you to respond? You know what? Forgive them. See, bitterness only kills you. And it amazes me that bitter people bring up things that happened 50 years ago. And in some cases, the person has apologized to them several times, but they will not let it go. You know, the Corinthian church, they were carnal. That means they were fleshly. They were dominated by the old man, the old sin nature, their selfishness. And so there was strife, division, and envying in the church. And when there's envying, there's always bitterness. You know, what's the standard mentioned here of forgiveness? As Christ forgave you, so also you must do. Were you worthy of being forgiven by Christ? Obviously, you deserved his wrath. When people try to say, well, they're not worthy of my forgiveness, they need to stop and look in a mirror. Come on. This is life of Christ living his life in you and through you. When you've got a justification and a but... We'll just say, leave it at that. You're not thinking like Christ. Christ is not living his life in you and through you. He takes it seriously. And we could go on that all day. See, the point is this. Relationships within the, the church are precious to Christ. We're members one of another. We need each other. And therefore, he sums it up in verse 14 by saying, but above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Interest of time, I'll just kind of summarize what someone else penned. It says, love here is spoken of as the outer garment or the belt which binds all the other virtues together in order to make up perfection. It holds together in symmetry all parts of the Christian character. Paul is emphasizing here that, we, that what we do must be done in genuine spirit of love for our brethren. Our actions are not the, to be grudging, but are to be born out of a wholehearted agape love. The Gnostics thought, of knowledge is the bond of perfection, but Paul corrects this view by insisting that love is the bond of perfection. See, manifesting life's Christ, the life of Christ in you and through you always equals love. That's what binds all these other virtues together. 
It's the love of Christ which compels you. It's the love of Christ that works in you and through you. That's the key to forbearing, the key to forgiving. That's why Peter says love covers the multitude of sins. See, agape love simply considers the person that needs to be loved. It never considers you. I mean, what a contrast in verse 8. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. We better go on. Christ, who is your life, is manifested in you and through you by allowing Christ's peace to rule your heart. Verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Some manuscripts say Christ, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. And be thankful. command here is to let the peace of Christ or the peace of God rule in your heart. You know, because we're at peace with Christ, we can experience the peace of Christ moment by moment. And as you respond to the, by faith to the Word of God and its grace and enjoy those blessings that are yours in Christ, you can have great inner tranquility and peace. This is mentioned in Isaiah 26.3, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. And so we are to enjoy the peace of God, which is the peace of Christ, which is a fruit of the Spirit, as we walk by faith in the principle of promises of God's Word. And this peace, which is a byproduct of the grace of God and the Word of God, is to rule in your heart. It means to act like an umpire, to arbitrate, to decide. It's to characterize the church. and See, the idea here is to let the calmness of Christ rule among you. This is in the context of the church. He's in control. It's to characterize the church and its functioning. God has provided an umpire to to end the uncertainty, to settle the disputes, to avoid the confusion in our lives, both individually and corporately as a body. But in order for an umpire to rule, you must submit to it. And so we need to allow the Word of God and the Spirit of God to take the Word of God and give us peace. And so it's the Spirit of God through the Word of God that produces the peace of God in the heart. You know, and if you don't know the Word of God, you can have a false peace in a hurry. I don't know how many young people I've talked to throughout the years that say, well, I've got peace about this when it's violating a a very obvious principle in the Word of God. I said, that's not God's peace because God can't deny Himself, and this is a violation of His Word, so I don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) That goes over really well, usually. (laughs) You know, peace in this context is relational. It has to do with the one another's in the body of Christ. And hearts is plural. And so we're not talking about the individual component here, but the corporate one as well. So do you allow the peace of God to rule in your heart, in your decision-making individually, and within the body here or your body, wherever your local church is, as you one another one another? Again, the Corinthians didn't do this. What did they have? Envy, strife, division, bitterness, the works of the flesh. And so you should allow the peace of God, which Christ gives to direct in your personal life and in the corporate life of the body. And as you do that, where I'm behind myself here, ahead of myself, you're to let the Word of Christ to dwell in you richly. This is all part of Christ manifesting His life in you and through you. Remember, you're to set your minds on things above. And setting your mind on things above includes communicated, what's communicated here in verse 16. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. See, the focus of this command is to is centered around the Word of Christ. And the Word of Christ is the Word of God that focuses you on Jesus Christ. Because He's to have the preeminence. It's about Christ. And so as you focus on Christ through the Word of God, it's His peace that will guide and direct you. Because Christ is the goal of your life. And Christ said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. 
And so you're to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Dwell is from Okinoki, whatever. It means to live in, to be at home. It means to be at home and be comfortable. It's more than merely influencing you. It means to take up residency and sit down so it becomes part of you. It's to be like your favorite chair. It's like that phrase, home is where the heart is. It characterizes you and what you pursue and what you think and what you meditate on. It's to be at home. And not only that, it's to dwell in you richly. The word means abundantly. It means to be highly prized and appreciated so that it permeates all who you are and all that you do. It's all that you think. Notice everything here is appealing to your what? Your thinking. Your thinking. You're to give the Word of God unrestricted liberty in your heart because Christ, this is the Word of Christ, and Christ is your life, and He is handcuffed to the Word of God. It's having the mind of Christ, which means you need to give it some attention, which means you are to be like what Paul told Timothy, to study your show, to show yourself approved unto God. Obviously, it can't dwell in you richly if you don't know it and if you don't meditate upon it. And Paul told the Ephesian believers that if you don't welcome this and receive it, that there's going to be instability in your life, and you're going to be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, and so forth. When you take a lackadaisical approach to the intake and meditation of God's Word, a dullness to God's Word develops, and you end up in a place you'd rather not be. See, if you don't allow Christ to have the preeminence in your thinking, and as you present yourself to Him and so forth, that means by default you present yourself to the flesh, and you'll be thinking about your objectives and your thing, and everything will have to be on your terms, and so forth, and it'll be about you, and you won't be forbearing and loving and forgiving and having tender mercies, because it's all about you once again. You're not going to take into account how God might want to use you within the body of Christ and so forth. You know, God wants to bear fruit in your life. And he's saying, will you allow my word to dwell in you richly to that end? Notice, with all wisdom, wisdom, Christ, in Christ are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It's having a love affair with Christ through the word of God, and he gives wisdom. And so the knowledge from the Word of God becomes specifically and prudently applied through Christ for His glory. This is Christ's life in you. Well, how is this going to be manifest in your life? We have three participles that tell us. Teaching, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. You know, this is a principle we've all heard several times. You simply spill what you're filled with. Christ said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so when you're letting the word of Christ dwell in your richly in all wisdom, it's going to be manifest in your life by pointing others to Jesus Christ. Do you point others to Jesus Christ? Is he the center of your life and your fellowship? Notice, you're going to be teaching and admonishing. There we have one another again in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Christ is never going to direct you to be a hermit somewhere. When you're having a love affair with Christ, since we're members one of another, the body of Christ is going to be important to you. These believers who conclude that the body of Christ is not important and think they're doing fine are missing it. I think I, that's all I need to say. You know, Christianity does not exist in a vacuum. It takes place in the middle of a real world, and that's going to be reflected in what you do and what you say especially to one another. Again, the context here is the body of Christ. And God's goal for the body of Christ is that it would be built up and edified. And that happens as believers in Christ take in the Word of God, allow it to dwell in them richly, they internalize it, they spill what they're filled with, and God gives the increase. It's really quite simple. And you're going to be singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. See, this is about being filled with the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit is allowing the Word of Christ to dwell in you richly and being thrilled with and focused on the grace of God that finds expression in itself 
and thankfulness both internally and externally. You know, I can tell you right now, if you're complaining and you're unthankful, you are not reflecting the life of Christ. His word is not dwelling in you richly because thankfulness is always a byproduct of having a love affair with Christ. I mean, if Christ is not in charge, why are we commanded to be thankful? We're commanded to be thankful because he's in charge. He does all things well. He makes no mistake, and therefore I can give God thanks. And when I'm thankful, I am enjoying my Savior regardless of the schmoes around me, right? See, Christianity is Christ. It's focusing on the things of him. It's allowing him to live his life in us and through us. And this finally brings us to verse 17. See, eventually, there's do's and don'ts, isn't there? And so this culminates by him saying, doing all that you do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ with thankfulness. This is manifesting the life of Christ. It's going to find expression in what you do and what you say. See, this functions as a summary verse of all the principles mentioned in verses 12 through 16. It's doing what you do thankfully for the Lord's glory. And again, this is not going to be fulfilled apart from you moment by moment, seeking those things which are above as you relate to your Savior by faith. You know, this is only like the third time in the book where something external is addressed. We're told to not fornicate. We're told not to let filthy language out of our mouth or lie to one another. And now he addresses our deeds, words and deeds. See, the words and deeds are the impact we have on others. These are the things that happen down below on planet Earth. These are the external things. These things flow from your members, which are on planet Earth. And again, we've been told the negative things. Don't use our members for fornication or let filthy language come out of our mouth. And here we have a positive admonition. And it's interesting, he says this here before he addresses the rest of the do's, starting with your wife, men, and your husband, wife, and your children, and so forth. He lays the groundwork of your relationship with him and then doing all in the name of the Savior before he addresses the specifics in the rest of the book. Your job, your family, hanging around the unsaved, hanging around the saved. There's three features here. It says, whatever and all, verse 17. Whatever and all, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. This is all encompassing. This is everything from A to Z. This is not just the spiritual realm. This is everything. We're to do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. There's no secular sacred split here. It's all for His glory. It's all done under the authority and approval of Jesus Christ. He is the goal of our actions and the motivation of our actions. We're due to all is His name. In His name. It's about Him. The Spirit of God's purpose is to exalt Christ. You live, according to 1 Corinthians 6.20, to exalt Christ. Everything you do is to exalt Christ. The idea here in doing all in the name of the Lord Jesus is that that, that the goal and objective is that the will of Jesus is being done in whatever takes place in your life. It's about honoring Him. Whatever, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And what's the stimulus here? And thankfulness to God. The thankfulness to God recognizes the privilege you have of being a child of God, knowing you are under His unfailing care and providence. You're in the hands of the Holy One. Christ is your life. And so everything is to be done with thankfulness. You know, unlike the unsaved, you've got an actual purpose for living that matters, not only in time, but for all eternity. The unsaved, his life's going to come to nothing, and then he's going to go to hell. And yet, if you're not thrilled with Jesus Christ and allowing him to manifest his life in you and through you, you have to go to a cheap substitute. And depending on your bent, you will try to satisfy the lusts of your flesh and of the mind. You will try to find some, satisfa some satisfaction out of the world and its criteria, which flop 
and flip like crappies. It changes every day. One day you're a glory boy, the next day you're the goat. And you're trying to get some satisfaction out of that, and it never delivers the goods. And you're on a treadmill going nowhere. And yet if you're having a love affair with Christ, he works in you and through you and manifests his life in you and through you. He gets the glory and you enjoy peace and satisfaction and purpose. I mean, what a privilege we have. I mean, just meditate on all the things that Pete brought to our attention last hour about seated in the heavenlies. Christ is in us, the hope of glory, all these things that are ours. And the believer says, ah, I want to I root for the Vikings instead. I mean, what a worthless cause. Guy watches the Vikings. He's out of fellowship till Monday at noon. He wasted a whole day putting hope in his Vikings where you can just enjoy Jesus Christ. And who cares about the Vikings then, right? But if, I tell you what, if you're not enjoying Christ, you've got to find it somewhere else. And if you find it there, is there a worse place of misery? Well, obviously there is, but I mean, come on. You see? You know, we deserve nothing from Christ, and yet he's given us all that we need. We are complete in him. Christianity is Christ. What a privilege it is to know him. We can do what we do as unto the Lord for His glory. We can be His vessel of mercy and kindness and forbearing and love. And we can make a difference that honors and glorifies Him. That's what it's all about. No do's and don'ts. No list of the nasty nine and the filthy five and the whatever eleven He said. And it's just not here because Christianity is Christ. Are you allowing Christ to live His life in you and through you? You know, I tried to summarize this paragraph, I tend to do this in a box up on the top of the uh, front side of your handout. This is it in a nutshell right here. Christ, who is your life, is to be manifested in mental attitudes that reflect His character as you allow His peace and the Word and His Word to direct you in the body of Christ as you do all in His name with thankfulness. That's the paragraph in a nutshell. That's it right there. And you know what? Since he does it all, since it's his life, he gets all the glory, and we reap all the benefits. I mean, does it get any better? I don't think so. Let's pray.